I just sitting over there, I can. <laughs> I feel guilty that? now. I've been switching the seats out forever. So I mean, copy of the last year's budget I can put under my chair. So. <laughs> sure. Sorry. All right. We're okay. I'll get All right. Up and we can start again. <laughs> okay. Oh. I think I'll ask the city clerk to to go ahead and read 3.1 again, and we'll sort of start over again. <laughs> Was the roll call kept? We've thing? called the roll and we have said the Pledge of Allegiance and we're ready for wards and proclamations. Nope. Well, he did. Okay. 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 All right. <laughs> <laughs> Item 3.1. The day of March 27, 2017 is Victory Day for Sacred Heart Knights Boys Basketball in the City of Salina. Pat Martin, Sacred Heart Knights Boys Basketball Head Coach, will read the proclamation. All right, sir. <laughs> proclamation for Sacred Heart Knights Boys Basketball. Whereas Sacred Heart Junior Senior High School was founded in 1908, representing the 108th year of service to the people and community of Salina. Whereas Sacred Heart Junior Senior High School is a fully accredited Catholic school and committed to provide a value-based environment that is conducive to each individual in preparing students for responsible adult leadership in society, world, and church. Whereas the city of Salina has a Catholic school that has a religious identity, which allows for spiritual formation and provides a strong commitment to academic excellence. Whereas the Sacred Heart Boys basketball program has long been a strong traditional program in the city of Salina, winning nine state championships in 1933, 34, 37, 54, 75, 79, 80, 81, and now finally 2017. Yay. Whereas the current <laughs> men's basketball program under the direction of head coach Pat Martin continue to bring success to Salina in areas of academic achievement, community service, and winning the 2A State Boys Basketball Championship. This is the 38th state championship won by the Sacred Heart Knights overall in their sponsored KSHSAA activities. So now, therefore, K.J. Crawford, Mayor of Salina, Kansas, do hereby proclaim the day of March 27, 2017, as Victory Day Sacred Heart Knights Boys Basketball. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the city of Salina, Kansas, to be affixed this day, March 27, 2017. Yay! Thank you very much. Come on up and I'll give you a copy of your proclamation. <laughs> and and bring one of the what players. Your victory here. speech, if we can. <laughs> yeah, you want to if say, you'd like to extend, something? if you'd like to extend your remarks. <laughs> There's your proclamation. Well. All right, thank okay. you. Okay, and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for everything you do. Thank All you. right. Come back again anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Win, yes. win again yes. any time. Win one. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. We're always proud of anyone that can play in those sports and do so well. And it's it's not easy. It's not nearly as easy as when I was in school. <laughs> it's a lot harder. Um, okay, we have a citizens forum. It's an opportunity for anyone who would like to come up and speak regarding an item that is not on the agenda. Give your name and address. Anybody out there would like to come up and speak? No? Don't see anybody. Okay. We don't have any public hearings or items scheduled for a certain time. Consent agenda. Item 6.1, approve the minutes of March 20th, 2017. And item 6.2, award of contract to install data cable for Salina Fieldhouse. Project number 53077 to Next Tech LLC in the amount of $42,215.92. Okay, is there anything that any commissioner wants to draw 
off and if not, I'll entertain a motion to. Madam Mayor, I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. I have a, an, uh, a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. We have no administration, development business, 8.1. Item 8.1, consider the purchase agreement for the vacant surplus residential building lot located at 2626 Quail Hollow Drive. And this was continued from March 20th. <coughs> Madam Mayor, Mayor and Commissioners, we bring back to you uh, an item that we started out this last, last city commission meeting. Uh, the item that we received an agreement uh, contract for an agreement for purchase of a property at 2626 Quail Hollow Drive from Todd Welsh Incorporated. At last month's, last week, excuse me, city commission meeting, you asked us to do some further study, and I think we have done some of that for you as well. We, in the packet, we added uh, the cost of factors of what the uh, existing appraised values from the county for the lots that are in the area of the Pheasant Ridge subdivision, as well as we've gone to uh, the Parks and Recreation Department and talked to them about uh, whether or not this would be an opportune time to move this uh, into a small pocket park. So Mr. Cotton from the Parks and Recreation Department has some information for you as well to discuss with you about the opportunities to turn this into a recreational park. So I will turn it over to Mr. Cotton. Mr. Cotton. How's everybody doing this afternoon? So we went out and uh, Rick Martin and, and Steve Hardesty and I went out and checked out the lot. And what you see here is, is, is an aerial of the lot or a picture that Gary sent. You go to the next page. Next slide, Tanner. So you can see it um, highlighted in red. The lot is approximately 118 uh, feet deep by 75 feet wide. Um, there's a view from the... the um, North, the um, northwest corner, <coughs> and then the the um, southwest corner from the from the um, northwest northeast, and then the, the northwest. That's a view of of um, Schilling Park. Um, some small pagodas or pavilions like that is is an option. It's something we could do. That's the new playground at Thomas Park. Another view of it. One of the problems that we would have at this park is now as we do new playgrounds, we need to make sure that they're completely ADA accessible. So we would need to figure out a way to do parking similar to this, I believe, for the playground, which would mean we'd have to curb cut and possibly do parking there in that manner. That's a schematic of the, of the playground at Thomas. So what you see here and what you should have in your packet is a, is a proposed cost to do the park. Um, all things considered, it would, it would cost roughly just over $150,000 to develop a park there. <clears throat> now, um, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. That, in my opinion, this is a park that I had when I was in Illinois. To me, that is a more desirable layout for a neighborhood park. That lot is approximately 385 um, deep by 240 wide. As you can see, I'm going to walk over here. I talk <coughs> loud, so you should still be able to hear me. Um, what you can see here is all of the neighborhood has access to the park. We have buffer zones with the streets, and this park is completely enclosed um, with a three foot fence so that kids don't run out in front of traffic. Um, it has a basketball court, a shelter, a playground, green space, and another uh, workout area. That would be our ideal location to do a neighborhood park in that area. If the purpose of the neighborhood park is to help develop the neighborhood, then we would suggest that we try to work with the developer or somebody to get a bigger lot to do it. If it's the, it's the commission's desire for us to take that, this existing lot and make it a park, we could do it, we could develop a park, but it isn't necessarily something that we'd recommend. Um, it's very close to the neighbors. I mean, it's, it's, I mean it's, the, the neighbors would definitely know the kids are using the park there. We could screen it with arborvita or some trees, but 
we don't think it's a, a necessarily be effective. Again, I'm all for parks. I'll do whatever direction that we're given to do, but we think a, a more land would be more appropriate for a neighborhood park in that area. How big is that piece? The existing uh, is it lot? an acre or is it um, so approximately one lot? quarter of an acre? This quarter, example one. 12,000 square feet, quarter. more or less. Quarter. Mm -hmm. We do have a. But this this one is what size? Oh, that one. I'm sorry. I don't know how many acres it is. That's, it? About, that's about two point yeah. Yeah. one yeah. acres. Looks like it's a, a, a good twice as much. It twice. is. We, we have one small park. We, we do have a small neighborhood park over in Woodland. Woodland Park's a, a pretty small. Right. Uh, park, we'd have something a little bit bigger than that, mm -hmm. but not much. And of course, Woodland's right there in a corner with no fencing really to keep. There's a fence between the property, but nothing to keep the kids from from the street. So. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, anybody have any questions? Yeah, just uh, I appreciate you coming back with this. I ask that we bring it back mm -hmm. with with some of this information. I really appreciate it. I think one thing for me that it really does, and I was hoping it would, is that it really illustrates how <coughs> important it is that when we do our parks master plan that we get the part in our ordinance where currently we require $200 a lot for parks, because I'll give you some comparison. At $25,000 value of that lot for a quarter acre, it would cost 250000 for us to buy that, that piece of parcel mm -hmm. when, when it comes down to. There are roughly 35 lots, and I appreciate you putting that in there, with the average lot being about 20000 plus, and I, and I assume that that chart on there means 20000 less what the special assessments are yes, on it. So it would be roughly the value of each one of those lots is actually about forty five to 50000 apiece. Um, but at 35 lots at $200, that's $7,000. We couldn't buy that. If, 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 we, if this were turned around and we said, let's try and buy that mm -hmm. lot for a park, we'd only have $7,000 to just buy it, forget the $150,000 to build it. So I think one of the things that this bringing back, and, and it's very valuable information to have because I think it really illustrates how little we currently um, look at how do we finance future parks. So I appreciate that. I also appreciate the fact that this is probably doesn't have the connectivity as kind of what you said of, of being an ideal location for the park. So I appreciate your uh, professional opinion on that. And just, just for uh, follow up a little bit, so all of our ordinance information, our current information for park development, that's already been all sent to the master plan company, and they're reviewing that and going to work on their right. on their recommendations as well. Right, and that's I remember good. reading that in their that's proposal. Good. I think it was th they made a pretty good point that that would be um, a focus, a, a focus of, of one at least one phase of that yes, of sir. that master plan. So appreciate that. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion on considering the purchase agreement for the vacant, vacant surplus residential building lot. Madam Chairman, I move we uh, uh, accept the purchase agreement for the vacant surplus lot at 2627 Quail Hollow. Second. I have a motion and a second to purchase or to consider the purchase agreement for the vacant surplus residential building lot located at 2626 Quail Hollow Drive. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Okay, 8.2. 8.2, consider acceptance of offered public drainage easement dedication and river trail addition. Mr. Andrew. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. We should have a graphic that we're able to pull up here, but this is an item where you're being asked to accept an offered easement dedication. I think you're familiar with the area. You approved a replat of the uh, northern portion of the River Trail addition, and as those improvements for serving that area are currently going in, and at the very south edge of that where the original River Trail meets 
River Trail second edition, there's an area we've identified that has a drainage issue related to the rear yards and so we look for an opportunity to get the rear yard water that's ponding out not only to the street but over to the old river oxbow and so uh, because this was not done through platting it's being done by separate instrument and so the, this is an older photo but this area has built out and this area right here is extremely flat and so the idea is to get an area drain in here and then to construct a storm sewer pipeline to drain from the back over to this oxbow and to complete that we need a five foot easement that the uh, owners of the new dwelling at 2237 Saddlebrook have agreed to dedicate so the storm sewer pipeline will be buried along here in this alignment and um, the Fleurlages who have purchased this house have agreed to dedicate that to the city of Salina. So the uh, action would be to authorize the mayor to accept that easement on behalf of the city. Any questions? Uh, Mr. Andrew, Andrew, who would be responsible for the um, upgrades to that sewer, uh, paying for the sewer line or the drainage line and, and so on? At this point, it's part of the subdivision improvements for River Trail second edition, so that would be part of the benefit district. The installation would be paid for by the developers. Okay. There's a, there, there'll be no city cost to the city on that then? I will confirm Is that with Mr. Nelson, but I understand that to be in public infrastructure as part of the development agreement between the city and the developers. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. Mr. Andrew. Entertain a motion on. Uh, Madam Mayor, I move that we accept the offered public drainage easement dedication in River Trail Edition from Rodney and Desiderata Fleurledge. Second. I have a motion and a second to uh, consider acceptance of offered and to authorize uh, the mayor to sign the easement document accepting the easement dedication on behalf of the city. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Okay. 8.3. Uh, Madam Mayor, I'm going to choose to recuse myself from this item. Thank okay. you. Item 8.3, application number Z15-10, requesting a change in the zoning district classification from A1 to R1 on a 48.80 acre tract of land located on the west side of Holmes Road, north of Magnolia Road. Item 8.3A, first reading ordinance number 17-10879. Okay. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Mm -hmm. uh, the nature of this request that's come before you is that the applicant, Magnolia Hills, Incorporated is requesting the rezoning of vacant agricultural zone land to R1 single family residential for the purpose of developing the next phase of a subdivision for single family homes. And so the request area is the area bordered in blue on this map and it's bordered by the Magnolia Hills Estates subdivision on the west, pasture land on the north, um, First Covenant Church on the south and Holmes Road and cultivated land to the east. As proposed, uh, this area comprises 48.8 acres and the proposal is to subdivide that into 104 new residential building lots. By way of comparison, the existing magna, if you could go back, John, to the aerial photo. Just by way of comparison, this is the original Magnolia Hills Estates subdivision that was platted in 2005. It contains 96 residential building lots and it is just about 100% built out at this point in time. At, at one time, Mr. Frank Norton owned almost this entire quarter section except for the little rural home site up in this corner and the First Covenant Church purchased 34 acres of that in 2000 
in this area right here. In 2005, Magnolia Hills Incorporated purchased 40 acres over here, which they developed as a subdivision. And then in 2007, they completed the purchase of the remainder of this property. And the 48 acres does not include a 16-acre sliver of land that comes down on the other side of, of the church. All of this property was annexed either in 2000 or a portion of it was annexed in, in 2005. So it's, it's been inside the city limits uh, at least partially since 2000 and in full since 2005. Uh, this application was originally filed in, in 2015 and we have worked uh, with the applicants and their design engineer to resolve some of the technical issues associated with the plat. As you're aware, there's been ongoing discussions about the status of Holmes Road and what it would take to get it to a suitably improved standard capable of carrying traffic that might be generated by a subdivision in this location. In March of 2016, the City Commission imposed a 90-day moratorium on preliminary plats with frontage on unpaved gravel roads. And at their uh, subsequent meeting, the Planning Commission uh, postponed consideration of this item pending a resolution of those items uh, subject to the moratorium. On June 16th, or June 6th, the City Commission extended that moratorium another 60 days uh, to allow additional modifications to be made to the draft ordinance. And in August, uh, the Planning Commission recommended approval and U.S. City Commissioners approved ordinance number 1610835 um, that dealt, amended the subdivision regulations to deal with this subject. So uh, that moratorium has now expired and we brought this item back, scheduling March 7th as a public hearing date for the Planning Commission to consider the rezoning application and a preliminary plat. Again, the, the request is for R1 single family zoning. That is the most common zoning district we have for our single family residential subdivisions. Um, it has the same uh, requirements as other subdivisions you've seen in front of you, including River Trail and Pheasant Ridge number three. The applicant believes that this property is well suited for development of single family homes due to its location, its topography, and most importantly, its accessibility to existing public utilities. And they believe that the current agricultural zoning inhibits the development of the site. They see it as a logical extension of their existing subdivision that they've developed directly to the west. Um, there are two distinct drainage basins on this property, but they both end up in the northeast corner right here, and the ultimate drainage is across Holmes Road and over to East Dry Creek. Uh, they're proposing a curb and gutter system for their streets and underground storm sewers to collect stormwater runoff and the ultimate plan is to construct a drainage basin up in this corner that will collect and detain all the runoff from this development. Uh, an important aspect of this, John, if you could go to the slide, I think it's identified as city sewer lines. One of the important things to understand about the uh, comprehensive plan and um, what it's showing in the way of the future residential growth areas of the city. This interceptor sewer line was installed in 1991 and the idea by its routing was to um, support future development uh, southeast and east portions of Salina and if you've driven down Magnolia Road you're familiar with there is a pump station right at that location on the south side of Magnolia Road. From that point there up to this point where that mark is, is that is a force main and you can only connect to a force main with another force main or pump station. And there has been a much discussed but not yet built plan 
to build another sewer lift station over here on the side of Markley Road. But this point right there is the point at which that becomes a gravity sewer system. And so this proposed subdivision would have access to the gravity portion of that line. And so due to that fact, there's really no limiting factors that would inhibit or restrict development of this property. It has proximity to water lines, to the Markley Road water tower, and most importantly, access to that sewer line. So as we looked at this, we agreed that the, the physical attributes on the property and most importantly, the available of public utilities makes this a suitable site for suburban residential type development. As we look to the character of the neighborhood, the plan is essentially to extend the same development pattern and density that you see to the property to the west. Um, there has been a purchase of the Hag Trust property to the north by Wheatland Development, which is Dan Daly, and the, the long-term plan identified for that property is also single-family residential of a suburban residential nature. So it appears that given the development pattern and the zoning in the area that approval of R1 zoning would be compatible with the surrounding development pattern, both existing and future. There is a 16-inch water line on Markley Road that runs along the east side of Markley and feeds the tower. Uh, the First Covenant Church is served by an 8-inch line that extends off a 12-inch line in Magnolia, and that line ties in at two points to this property, and so the Director of Utilities believes that the uh, water distribution system is, is more than adequate to provide the volumes and pressures needed to support residential development. Um, as I noted, their plan would be to simply tie into a manhole in this existing interceptor sewer line to serve the subdivision and to provide storm drainage control through a detention pond up in the northeast corner. The fire response would be from station number four, which is about a five minute response to the stone post <coughs> interest on Markley Road. Police protection would be provided once public streets are constructed and open. I think it's surprise some planning commissioners that this property is located in the enrollment area for Lakewood Central and for Metal Arc School. And part of the reasoning for that is that the school district has made an effort to keep the enrollments balanced between Central and South and Lakewood and South Middle. And so this, they identified this as a future residential growth area and assigned students here to the to the Lakewood and Central districts. Um, there are no neighborhood parks in this area. There are no park sites currently identified on the city's neighborhood park plan. And so absent that, there would be a park fee collected of $200 per dwelling in this location. As to streets and traffic, we have calculated that at ultimate build out, there'd be about 1,040 vehicle trips generated out of this subdivision that would be dispersed both east and west. And so the phasing of the development and the timing of a future connection to Holmes Road would become important to make sure that that property can be dispersed both east and west. As far as a comprehensive plan, John, if you want to go to that, um, both the urban service area first and then the comprehensive plan. This is the urban service area map for the city. The yellow are areas identified for future residential suburban type growth. And so this it's not shown as yellow here because it is, it's not growing the city limits. It's actually inside the existing city limits, so they're not attempting to annex any additional property in, but this property here is all identified as, as future suburban residential land use. On page 29 and 30, 
The plan states that future residential growth is envisioned to the east and southeast of the current city limits, the existing residential development pattern and services, as well as the proximity to infrastructure and developable land make this an ideal place for future neighborhoods of Salina. So the sup suburban residential envisions development at two to five units per acre and the anticipated development here is 2.2 units per acre so it would be consistent with that land use designation. The Planning Commission uh, conducted a public hearing on March 7th. It was pretty well attended by residents of the existing Magnolia Hills Estates addition. Um, they were not there to oppose the rezoning. Their primary concern dealt with traffic and balancing the traffic going east and west as also their primary concern was that if this property were developed and infrastructure was installed in phases that they wanted some plan in place where heavy equipment, trucks, things involved in constructing streets and water and sewer would be required to come from the east off of Holmes Road and not through the existing neighborhood. Um, after hearing that public comment, the Planning Commission voted five to zero to recommend approval of the applicant's request and they offered four reasons in support of their recommendation. Um, that the property is not suitable for single family housing development if the agricultural zoning in place remains, that the location and physical attributes of the property and availability of public utilities make it suitable for urban density residential development, provided that there are adequate insurances in place to make sure Holmes Road is improved as, as part of that process. The Planning Commission found that this would be an illogical extension of an existing residential subdivision and that the R1 zoning would be compatible with the zoning and land uses of nearby properties. They found that public utilities were either in place or could be readily extended to serve the entire 48 acres and they found the zoning change to be consistent with the city's comprehensive plan which shows this as a future suburban residential development. So your options this afternoon would be to concur with the recommendation of the Planning Commission and approve the attached ordinance on first reading. Second reading would be held in abeyance until final platting of the property. If you disagree with the recommendation of the Planning Commission, you could return it back to them for reconsideration, but you would need to give them some direction as to uh, the basis of your disagreement, or you could overturn the recommendation of the Planning Commission and deny the request if you have four votes in support of such action and alternate findings are developed. So with that, I'd be open to any questions that commissioners might have. We can view any of the maps or drawings. One thing I did want to have, John, is we had the uh, language there, I think, was an excerpt from the comprehensive plan. Do we have that? available. I think it's under growth and development. This is just an excerpt from the comprehensive plan and it states that while infill and redevelopment will assist in stabilizing deteriorating neighborhoods and provide living and business opportunities for many, there is a desire in Salina to live in new houses and new neighborhoods. To provide this opportunity, growth areas have been identified to accommodate new neighborhoods, housing, services, and jobs. And so this area is in one of those identified growth areas. The other important aspect is that new growth should occur in a contiguous manner adjacent to existing development supported by public infrastructure. And so one thing about this property is it is contiguous to an existing residential subdivision and it is capable of being supported by public infrastructure uh, from a water and sanitary sewer standpoint. And the other aspect of that is that this part of Salina, uh, one of the points of emphasis was that the city needed areas that were not subject to flooding or in mapped floodplains for future 
residential development and that is one of the attributes of this property is it is uh, not in or near any flood prone areas. So with that, we'd be open to any questions that you have and we'd be happy to put up any drawings or illustrations that you might want to see. Uh, just two and a half questions, I think. Uh, historically, in development of this size, what has happened with the money collected for the parks? You know, just referencing the example that we looked at about 30 minutes ago. It is correct it's a, it's a that a small the, amount of money. It's a small amount of money. It is primarily. It was recognized at the start that that was a small amount of money, and it was primarily identified for adding amenities or improvements to parks within those service areas. It's certainly not enough money accumulated to actually purchase a park. So was there ever any intent to have a park included within the development? There was never an intent and in what we do have an existing neighborhood park plan. It's outdated and it needs to be updated. But what we do when we have a subdivision proposed is that we go to the neighborhood park plan and we look to see if there's been a future park identified in that area. We do have a park dedication ordinance and we have had parks dedicated to the city as part of subdivisions if it's an area that has been identified in the park plan as a future park site. But there has not been any future park site identified in this general vicinity. Has that issue been looked at specifically or it's just not been identified in the past? Well, we can only go by the existing neighborhood park plan. We're anxious to see. Right, I mean, this area probably wasn't in consideration the last time that plan was. Well, it, it was, at. that was done in 1997 and this area has been identified as a future growth area since the interceptor sewer and all that went in, but there is no doubt that our neighborhood park plan needs to be updated. The other question, uh, just so I'm clear, at the end of the day, is the zoning change we're considering now held hostage to resolution of the Holmes Road upgrade? It is. So there's two things that would have to occur. The developers are already on the record as seek, wanting to seek a development agreement relating to Holmes Road and they would also have to have a final plat that is satisfactory before they would get second reading or final approval of their zoning. And the plan now does not include any exits onto Holmes Road? The plan does have and a required street connection to yeah. Holmes Road. Okay. And okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, no. Now, I know shot. there's probably another follow-up question to that, but I'll, I'll think of it. Go ahead. Okay. So hold it. <laughs> just, just so everybody understands, the amendment that was approved for the subdivision regulations makes it, it the developer's responsibility to upgrade Holmes Road both along the entire frontage of their property but all the way out to the connection to Magnolia. That was and, the second half. And that, that, okay. <laughs> that is a non-discretionary item for the Planning Commission. And so they approved a preliminary plat subject to the developers being responsible for improving Holmes Road from this point all the way out to Magnolia. And the only body that can modify that requirement is you, the governing body, not the Planning Commission. Okay. Um, my question, I guess, relates to, uh, and maybe this is for Mr. Gage, today we are just looking at the rezoning of this area. We're not looking at any plats and it doesn't, it doesn't commit us to any plats or to the way it's platted at this point or does no, it? That's correct. Yeah, the, the, today's action is the first reading on a rezoning and that doesn't commit you to anything. I get, and I get, so I guess a follow-up because um, as Commissioner Blanchard pointed out and, and uh, Commissioner Davis noted again, um, obviously it looks like we're going to need to take a look at um, what our 
park land requirements are in new developments or what are what we're going to need to assess per lot if we're actually going to keep our parks where our people are. Um, any revisions that we make in the code or in that process at this point, would this development be subject to that or or not? I mean, because we're just redoing the zoning at this point, so it would be not until it's actually platted that, um, well, that I wanna, that occurs. I want to clarify that we do already have a parkland dedication ordinance. Developers are either required right. to dedicate land for a park right. or, or pay the fee. Right, and, and I so understand, and I think it's been established that the $200 per lot fee is right. not sufficient for us to develop any new park land. It's just, I believe you indicated earlier that we, we put those resources into existing parks at this point. It's also important to understand that that under Kansas law is an excise tax and the Kansas legislature froze the ability of cities to change or raise excise taxes. So the f fee has not been raised because the legislature took away the ability of cities to impose or raise existing fees. Okay, so it might be a point of whether we need to start looking at and hopefully the, the new parks master plan will help us pinpoint what areas need to, um, that we need to add parkland to. So maybe if we can't raise the fee on, fee per lot, if that's not, if that's something that the legislature is, has, has overruled us on, then um, maybe we need to look at increasing our parkland requirements and developments. I mean, I don't know, but it just seems untenable the way it is. Is, is from the, my perspective. The two most recent neighborhood parks that the city of Salina has were both dedicated to the city at no cost by developers. One of those is Oxbow Park, which is mm -hmm. over next to the flood control levy off of Courtney that was dedicated as part of a subdivision plat. And there is a park that most people don't know about over on Red Hawk Lane in the Golden Eagle area. It's 4.75 acres and that was dedicated to the city at no cost. And so the way the ordinance works is that if a developer dedicates land for a park, and that's identified as an area where the city wants a neighborhood park, then the first step is the subdivision plat goes to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, and they advise everyone whether they have identified as a park that they want and if that's the case, then the plat is adjusted accordingly before it goes to the planning commission. But that has, the first step is, is to see if it's in an area where a, a park has been identified. And so far, the only recreation area in this vicinity is the East Crawford recreation area, which probably does not qualify as a neighborhood park. Yeah, commissioners, one of the things that would be helpful when we look at the park master planning is to say how many residents should a neighborhood park serve? And, and when we have that number, you can then start to guesstimate the land area that would be served as you start to think geographically. And then once you have that scale, it's a little bit easier to be thinking about what would the fee be, how would it be collected, what are the tools, uh, and what aspect of the park cost do you wish to recover and utilize 100%, 50%, whatever it might be, and also be thinking about land dedication. And at the same time, try not to put the full burden on the one developer that may actually have that particular piece of land when there are multiple developments that, that we would expect to uh, contribute folks right. to the park. Benefit so from it. I think it'll help us kind of put together a better uh, picture for how we would want to do that, and then we can try to figure out the right tool to apply. Would the connective components be sort of handled at the plat? Planning stage? And I, yeah, I would think so because you have the, we think of the park as the destination piece as we're talking about right now, but the, the I call the linear park or the trail or sidewalk systems to get people to the park would be an aspect of that as well. So I think without question that's a part of the conversation. Because right, that, that's somewhat important because this area, it, it's not connected along Magnolia or Markley to either of two fairly large parks, you know, in a car are fairly close, but on a bike or on foot, those parks are miles away, or as far as the danger. 
in getting to them. Th those issues be be handled in the development agreement pursuant to 16, 10, 835? Well, they could. Right now you're under a, as Dean mentioned, you're under a 20-year-old uh, park, call it an excise tax. I'm not sure if it's excise tax or an impact fee or a combination mm -hmm. of both, but under that policy, uh, so a lot of that depends on the timing as well. Uh, we, we definitely need to look at that policy if we wait for the comprehensive plan to help us with the some of the geographic questions and assumptions, then you're going to be looking a little further out possibly than, than what this process might take you. So it might affect the timing of it. Uh, but when you look at this, there's a lot, if just when you look at the area, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't probably stop looking to the north at where this development is. There's a lot of property and I think what you're going to find is when you look at a neighborhood park, you're going to be looking at a larger area than even this whole area that's fully developed plus what's developed to the west. I think you'll be looking at a bigger area than that. Yeah. So it, uh, <coughs> I, if, if this were surrounded by streets all the way around, you might, uh, an undevelopable property, you might find that you may not have another opportunity, but I think you do have plenty of opportunity as we look to the north. So I don't know that it's um, that big a deal, but I do think that as we work that uh, park plan, we need to really clarif clarify the picture of what we want to do. And I didn't include the map in our slides, but we do, as part of the neighborhood park plan, we have nine neighborhood park service areas. So one of the requirements of the existing program is that if you are in neighborhood park service area number seven, which this property is, then all funds collected in this area must be spent within that neighborhood park service area. So we have areas north of Crawford. This is the area south of Crawford. We have different areas down along Schilling Road. Each of the different subdivisions is in a different neighborhood park service area. So the fees that are collected are, are deposited into a fund for that park service area and we have nine different areas right now. So that somewhat disperses the funds. You can't really pull them together and that may be another thing that needs to be looked at is if, if you have nine different pots of funds and they can only be spent in that area, you can't accumulate enough funds to, if you pull funds from all nine park service areas then you might have dollars to have an impact. But as long as they're dispersed that way, the balances in each of the service area funds is not substantial. Okay, any other questions? <coughs> we do have representatives of the applicant here if you'd yes. like to hear from them. Um, hello, I'm Stan Bikewist, 2301 South Ohio. I'm here representing the, the three partners of uh, Magnolia Hills Estates. Uh, I want to thank you for your time in, in hearing this ordinance. I want to thank the staff for uh, what I consider a very concise uh, ordinance here. And I would hope that you would uh, let us continue in developing what we consider a uh, a healthy, happy neighborhood. And I will take any questions if you have any. Okay. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> okay, I'll entertain a motion on application Z15-10 and first reading ordinance number 1710879. Madam Mayor, move uh, Approval on first reading ordinance number 17-10879. Okay, do, do, we need need rest? A, do we need approval first on the application? I'm just going to I think it's just a matter of first reading on the ordinance. Okay. I didn't need to include all the other no. information in there. I don't believe so, oh, Commissioner. Okay. I have a motion to approve on first reading ordinance 1710879. Is there a second? Second. I have a, a motion and a second to approve on first reading ordinance 1710879. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Okay. Uh, would somebody step out and get Commissioner Ryan? There he is.
Other business. Other business. Uh, I move to recess into executive session for 30 minutes to discuss with legal counsel matters subject to the attorney-client privilege for the reason that public discussion of those matters would waive the privilege and adversely affect the city's interest in the matters and reconvene at 5.45. Second. Three-minute break. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. A I motion and a second. 5.45. <laughs> okay. Motion and a second to uh, request for executive session. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, opposed, same sign. Is there any business? After? No, there won't okay, be. Okay, no business. Okay. <laughs> 